In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about why recurring revenue in your cash or hybrid practice is a must have and how it can dramatically, not just stabilize your business, but also dramatically increase the actual value of your business long-term if you ever go down the path of deciding to either sell it or maybe potentially autopilot your practice. Just for context, my name is Jamie Matei. I'm the founder of a company called Physical Therapy Biz, where we help cash and hybrid practices scale past uh, just themselves up to seven figures and beyond um, all over the US and Canada. We have to date helped over a thousand practices start and scale. And this is one area that I think that almost every practice that comes into our ecosystem to work with us uh, really has to improve and work on. And once they get these things in place, they see a massive improvement in their business and really the um, ability to run the business effectively and not necessarily have to guess as much about the next steps that they can take, whether that be moving to a bigger space, hire somebody, uh, or what, whatever the next step in their business is. And it's because recurring revenue is stability, is the way I look at it. Recurring revenue is stability in your business. It's the business that you don't have to go out and try to find every single month that you know is gonna be there and is gonna be predictable for you and your business partners if you have any, or for the staff that you have that you're looking to bring on, or maybe move into new roles. So it allows you to be much more stable and make better decisions because of knowing in, in, in a more sort of strategic way what your revenue is going to look like versus the months where you may have massive volume or they have big drops and this happens seasonally in a lot of uh, locations as well and recurring revenue can really help dial that in for you now let's chat a little bit about recurring revenue and really what that is so the way that we look at it is really any sort of revenue that is coming back into your business where you're not having to go out and find a new customer to generate that now this could be there's recurring and reoccurring revenue i'm not going to get into the nuances of the two for me i just care about whether somebody's coming back in whether that's a true membership, a contract, or that is them, you know, getting a plan of care and chipping away at it, or even other services that don't even involve direct patient care, which I'll talk about a couple of those that we see as really strong recurring revenue drivers. So for us, the gold standard that we want to see in a practice is really to get to the point where they're at 50% um, of their revenue being recurring revenue. Okay. That is like a bulletproof practice. If you can get to half your revenue being recurring, uh, that that is going to put you in a great place. You're going to be way less stressed out. You know, you're going to have so much better predictability of where you're hiring somebody or uh, you're, you're making a bigger move and transitioning to a bigger space in the business. That's awesome. We're ha very happy if people can get to 30%, right? So if you can get to 30% of your revenues, you know, 30% uh, of every dollar that comes in is coming from somebody coming back for a service or something that you're selling on an ongoing basis, that's still an incredible place to be. And it adds a lot of value and predictability to your business. Most people that we work with are 10% or below. And honestly, probably not even tracking this. Um, that's probably step number one is let's go ahead and get you to track this so that you know how, where your revenue is coming from. Is it recurring? Is it just one-off revenue? Or what we consider like higher ticket-based, you know, upfront revenue? It, it's, it's really about figuring out what those channels are and then start tracking the right things so that we can start making a measurable improvement in the areas that we wanna actually make better. So recurring revenue, again, ideal, ideal, best case scenario is ha half of your revenue, but if you get to 30% in service-based business, that's actually really, really good still. So wh where does this recurring revenue come from, right? And there's, there's really three options. Main options, people people have some variances if you know they have very specialized things to do in their practice, but the main areas are are going to be recurring visits. So that means people that are coming back for sessions with you for whatever it is that you do. Let's say that you are a, uh, a manual therapist, right? You're great with your hands and you can make a lot of changes positively that people, you know, they love and they feel better and they're able to do the things they like to do. And people are coming back, let's say, on a monthly basis to work with you. As just an example, you know, they, they either buy a plan of care with you and then they use those visits as they want, or you have a structured plan in place that's maybe more of a membership style where they're coming in on an ongoing basis for a plan that you're selling on the back end of a plan of care that you've completed. Um, this is the most common one that we see and probably the one that's gonna make up the vast majority of uh, revenue with this. And I'll give you a really good example of, of how powerful this can be. Uh, one of the first consulting contracts I took was working with a, uh, a group out of uh, California that specifically focused on a functional range conditioning style of training. So um, they would take their patients through, you know, hands-on stuff with a FRC or functional range conditioning approach, which if you've ever done that, it's very tedious, it's very difficult. Uh, it does actually require some oversight by somebody that knows what they're talking about because it's very, very 
uh, tedious little movements and doing it correct can be kind of challenging. But if you do it and you do it with guidance, you actually feel really good, uh, especially if you're struggling with some, some, uh, some joint issues or maybe it's like end range control uh, or pain in a joint that you can kind of work through with, with somebody that we're talking about. And this group that, that I took this contract with, um, they, that was their approach. They were heavy in the FRC sort of approach. And per provider, they only needed something like four uh, new people per month in order to maximize or, or saturate a schedule. So, and the reason was everybody that they worked with would come back in basically on a weekly basis forever, uh, almost as if they were like their, you know, specialized trainers to do this FRC plus a little bit of hands-on style approach that, uh, that they would position as just a part of their sort of their training, honestly. And uh, it snowballs so fast. Uh, and it was amazing to see, to be able to have people sort of move this direction and commit to, you know, a visit a week and in a lot of places. And they were in an area that was a sweet spot from a uh, health conscious affluence sort of area where people would pay $250 a week to come in and work with them, you know, once a week to do this style of training. So, you know, for them, it was, it was awesome. And the recurring side of their business was probably 70% uh, of where they were at and they snowballed so fast. And to the day, like this business is actually doing really, really well and they've grown a ton. So just as an example, instead of having to try to find 12, 15 people, if you're you know, not keeping anybody around, they only had to find three or four. Now think about that for a second. Which one do you think is gonna be easier for you from a lead gen standpoint? I mean, obviously it's going to be you know, finding uh, three or four people versus 12. So that's recurring business, that's a big one. Uh, the second one is group training. And personally, I think big group training, I don't think is the best fit for clinicians. Um, not to say you can't coach it, but in your facility, you probably don't have the space for it. But small group or semi-private training is, a, is an option that we see a lot of clinicians uh, be able to do really well with. And in that example, it would be you know, a small group of, let's call it four to six people, and you have somebody that's running that, uh, a class that they're gonna all train in together. It's small enough that you can individualize a lot of things, you know everybody's name, you can modify things on the fly for them, um, but you can build a general program that's going to be, you know, really kind of catch everything that they, uh, you know, th that they need to do. And, and from there, you know, you can develop a recurring model that brings them in once a week, twice a week, three times a week, whatever it is that you wanna do, however you wanna set it up. And you can have a clinician or a coach that's fulfilling on that, which is great because it gives you some flexibility in, in how you wanna fulfill that. The margins on that can be really good. It depends what you charge per session. You know, we're seeing people charge anywhere between 30 and 80, sometimes uh, up to $100 per person per session, depending on their area and depending on the niche that they focus on. Um, so, so you can have a great you know, hourly uh, rate, a total rate. Let's say you have five people that are coming in at 60 bucks each, that you're generating $300 for that hour, which is really, really good. Um, obviously in comparison, most people's uh, single visit rate is not that high, so it can be great. And it's also a very sticky uh, service, something that people will come back and they'll train with the people that they're getting you know, to know. Uh, Misery loves company, it's very sticky, and it's something that can be a bolt-on to practices that adds a decent amount of recurring revenue. And even a couple of these small groups can literally add you know, uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars of recurring revenue to your business on a monthly basis. The, the third part is remote coaching. And remote coaching would be you managing people via technology, and maybe it's even like virtual check-ins with um, you know, uh, like, a, like a Zoom interaction or something. Uh, like that, or maybe it's a combination of face-to-face -face and remote coaching. It, you can set it up a lot of different ways. You can have a clinician fulfill this, you can have a coach fulfill this. Um, there's, there's a number of ways you can do this. It really depends on how you wanna set it up. And there's not, I wouldn't say a specific gold standard. Some people love to have a visit on a you know, monthly basis, or maybe it's every other month, and then they're managing their, their program remotely. Some people wanna do all remote, and they wanna be able to like, have a lot of communication in, bet in between with people. Um, you know, some people want to have more sort of generalized blanket programs uh, that are cheaper and that they're, they have fewer touch points. It, it, it's up to you in some ways. Um, I will say for us, what we found is uh, being able to have a, uh, a remote option is great, especially for people that are traveling quite a bit for work uh, or people that have a home gym. And a lot more people have home gyms now than they did prior to 2020. So when we look at remote coaching, it's definitely an option. And when we had our practice, and even to this day, because you know we the, the practice that we uh, that my wife and I started, 
We started in 2014 and we, we sold it uh, two years ago. So it just had its 10 year anniversary actually. Um, and they're doing great. And they, they still practice these three uh, variables of recurring revenue. So they have recurring visits that are part of the sales process. They have group training and they have remote coaching. And what's nice about this is you can actually feed people into things that are a better fit for them. Um, and by doing so, you have more options for the back end sales process that allows you to have an increase in uh, percentage of that revenue that is going to say yes to it, right? And that is going to generate recurring revenue for you. So I actually like to have a combination of all of them. You may not have the capacity to do that. You may just need to focus on one to start with. And I don't think you should do all these at once. If you don't have as complex of a business or as, as a tight of business systems to be able to run these things and fulfill them, then I would say focus just on one thing. In particular, focus just on recurring visits. That's the easiest thing you can do, you know, and you can do either a structured membership or it can literally be, you know, hey, um, now that we've solved this problem, what do you want to do next? You know, like what's your physical goal? What's something that you want to work towards? Let's buy, let's get another package. It'll be a better you know rate per session for you. And then let's just chip away at it over this amount of time. I think it'll take about that long for us to get to this goal, or this is when this race is, you know? And then now all of a sudden it's not just, you know, I solved this pain problem, but now we're working on an athletic goal of some sort or, you know, some sort of goal that they have that they want to achieve. There's also an opportunity for you to do this with friends and family, uh, or, or really more family and kids. And you can say, all right, cool, with this plan of care, if your, if your family, which is active, like your kids are playing sports, or you know, your, your wife trains, you train, whatever, uh, like you guys can share this. And that is one of the best ways that we found to generate recurring volume is through active families, which are awesome because they also work with and, and, and hang out with other active families, which are a great uh, referral source for you in a number of ways. So I would say focus on the recurring visits first before you do anything else. The other things are much harder to fulfill on because you don't really have those things set up. Um, but very, very, very doable. Um, and if it's something that you decide, man, I want to try to uh, engineer these things into my practice. I have the space for it. I have the people for it. I just don't know how to do that. These are things that we help people with all the time. You can head to physicaltherapybiz.com, check out what we do. Uh, but this area right here is one of the areas I think that we do better than anybody in terms of really establishing a model that doesn't is not predicated on solely just get more new patients in. It's literally build a better business. Build a better business because it's, it's, it's not just the front end business, it's not the revenue you're making, it's also the value of the business. And I'll explain that in just a second as well. So let's talk about why recurring revenue is so important. And, and, and we've kind of touched on some of these things, but the, the really, really huge one as a business owner, and I think this is, you know, for me, uh, such, I, I can't overstate how great this is, is, is the stress factor of not being so dependent on new volume is, is a life changer for outside the clinic, okay? Uh, when, when I was just, you know, getting, uh, tons of new patients and they were all, they were all basically seeing me for like three sessions and then I would never see them again because I gave them no, no reason to come back in. Um, it was very stressful. I mean, I had months where just by myself, just myself, I would see 25 plus new patients and I would have, you know, not a lot to show for that. Right. Like, uh, we had one year where we had over, I think it was 550 new patients in a year between two providers and we had almost no recurring revenue because we didn't actually have anything built in. And if I could go back and tell myself one thing when I was doing that, it would be, hey, dummy, like give these people a reason to come back and see you because like they have other things to work on. And what's interesting is like they, they may not want to tell you like, oh, I would like to train for this 10K or whatever. Like you need to ask these things uh, and, and see what they want to do and see if there's a fit for you to be able to help them. And being proactive about things is a great approach. Like we've done this with, you know, professional uh, organizations and athletes and people that are competitive, but the average adult, the, the, the daily, uh, you, you know, uh, weekend warrior, the, the this executive athlete, the person that is just trying to live a healthy life, like they don't prioritize that as much. And frankly, they probably need it more because they just don't have the support or the knowledge around them. And that's where we can fit really well. So recurring visits are great, great place to start, but it decreases your dependency on new volume. And that is a, a, a way, way better business to run. And it's going to decrease your stress levels a ton, which allows you honestly to be able to be more present with your family, to be able to be uh, a happier person in general outside of your business. I can tell you, like, if, if your business isn't doing well, I can promise you, you're not um, the most enjoyable person to be around. Like, it's hard to compartmentalize that because it affects basically everything, right? So that's one big one. Enterprise value is another huge one. And this is really interesting. And this is something that I don't hear enough, I, don't, I really don't hear anybody talking about this in our industry, uh, mainly because not a lot of people have actually bought or sold uh, cash-based practices in particular. Uh, we've done this a lot. Uh, I've done it myself. I've helped other people do it. And it's, it's interesting when you look at the way that investment bankers value businesses. 
So for me, I've, I've had the opportunity to now, you know, sell and or acquire multiple businesses and help a number of businesses sell, not just in the cash uh, PT world, but uh, outside of it as well. And what I thought was, was fascinating is I started to really dive into the world of investment bankers. And investment bankers are basically just that they're not actually at a bank, uh, you know, um, giving, you know, loans out or something like that. They're basically, um, they're trying to uh, do deals. Uh, they're trying to raise money to do deals potentially, or they're bringing deals to market. Think of them like a realtor for businesses. Okay, that's basically what they are more so than anything. And with, with investment bankers, with one of the main things they look at is what percentage of the revenue is recurring revenue. This is why when I go back to my, my you know, uh, numbers, like if I look at this, like this is why for me, if I know we can get 30% uh, recurring revenue in a business, it's gonna be worth a lot more to one of these uh, one of these investment bankers. It's gonna be worth a lot more to a business uh, or a bank if they're gonna give somebody a loan to buy that. So you can increase the value of your business. And and long term, like I, you may just be starting your business. Maybe you're further along in your business. But most businesses will never sell. They, they have no value. They're not worth it to anybody else enough for them to buy it. And it is, uh, it's really sad to see because you put so much effort and work into these these businesses that truly do have value if built the right way and can create like generational family wealth for you and your family. They can they can definitely create the uh, incredibly uh, comfortable retirement for you at a minimum if you do this the right way. And enterprise value is essentially what that business is worth to another buyer. Recurring revenue increases the revenue, uh, it increases the multiples on that that actual business. Meaning, for every dollar that you have that is recurring, it's it's valued at a higher valuation, a higher multiple than the business that is not recurring. So let's say you have 50% of your revenue is recurring and you have, uh, a, let's say, a million dollar business that is generating $300,000 in net revenue. And they're gonna look at that net revenue as what they're gonna value the business on. Well, let's say you have $300,000 and it, there's zero recurring revenue coming in. Now you're going to get a lower multiple. Let's say let's say they're valuing these on a, a three to six sort of uh, times multiple of your net revenue. So in this scenario, if it's three hundred thousand dollars, then it's going to be three to six times that. So on the low end, nine hundred thousand. On the high end, uh, one point eight million. Right. So basically double. Well, if you have half your revenue coming from recurring revenue you're gonna be on the upper end of that uh, multiple scale. If you have no revenue coming from recurring revenue, you're on the lower end of that. So in this example, if you have a, a, a business that's doing a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue, if a good chunk of it is recurring, you can damn near double your business value at the sale in comparison to not having any uh, value that is re any revenue coming from recurring revenue. So when we look at this, this can, you know, let's call it 1.5 to 2x what you get for this business. Like it, it could be massive, you know, to go from, let's call it a $900,000 sale to let's say a one and a half million dollar sale. That's a huge difference for something that also makes your business better to run, which is why they, they value it more. It makes it easier for them to run the business. They make it easier for them to put somebody else in your business to be able to run it. So keep in mind, you're not just doing this for no reason. You're doing this because A, it's gonna help you uh, have a, a more stable business, but also it's gonna make your business worth more money. Okay, worth more money to any outside investor or any person you would sell it to or any business uh, a bank that you may need to get a loan from, right? Just makes your business look more robust and harder to ruin, essentially, right? That's why. So predictability is the other big one. This is one issue that we see a lot with people is they don't know when to hire. They have a hard time understanding, well, when do I hire? Do I time it right? Sometimes uh, it's a guessing game, right? We know we want to see certain uh, metrics of density of schedules before people will go to hire. But, um, you know, there's seasonality in all businesses. And the thing with recurring revenue is, you know, you have a base of revenue that is going to be there uh, no matter what. Like, that's going to be very stable. And it, and it might fluctuate up and down a little bit because there is churn. But it's going to be a lot more stable than if you're just dependent solely on new patient volume. So this allows you to be more predictive of people you're hiring, technology you're reinvesting in, spaces you're moving into. Um, you know, any number of things that are going to be big business decisions that are a bit scary to do. This allows you to have uh, a, you know, a more p predictable manner of making the right decision uh, and for you to have sort of a safety net of revenue that's there in case it takes you a little bit longer for you to prove that business decision was the right thing. Like bring somebody on, for instance, right? If you bring a new provider on and maybe your, your new patient volume doesn't grow as fast as you thought it would, 
Um, but you're not in such a bad spot where you have to let that person go because they're cannibalizing the schedules of everybody else because there's so much recurring revenue. So this really helps you make better decisions and more predictability. The last thing would be lifetime value. And this really is the same thing for me as enterprise value um, because this is another big metric that people are gonna look at. Like what's the lifetime value of one of your patients, one of your clients? And you know, there's interesting stats around uh, something like Starbucks. This is crazy. So Starbucks, their lifetime value of a customer is it's something like between six and seven thousand dollars. So six to seven k is Starbucks lifetime value. Think about how many cups of coffee that is. That's that's a lot. If if you don't know your lifetime value as a customer, that's something that you should start to calculate. Which is basically, on average, how much money is somebody spending with you over the the time that they're a client. And if you have a newer business, it's actually really hard to calculate because you just don't have that long of a history of being in business. But if you've had a business for a few years, go back in, look at how many clients you have, look on average how much they've spent with your business over that duration of time, and that'll give you a pretty clear idea of what your lifetime value is. But if you look at lifetime value, it's basically a combination of both front end and back end services in this example for these type of businesses that people are spending money on. So if you have a plan of care that's worth $1,000 and you have nothing that anybody can purchase outside of that, that's it, and then you discharge everybody, your lifetime value is gonna be, let's call it $1,000 if everybody did that, which not everybody's going to, it's actually be lower than $1,000, but in this scenario, let's just say it's 1,000 bucks, okay? Let's say you have a front-end program that's $1,000, so your plan of care initially 1,000, and then you have a back-end program that's $1,000, where they work with you for another year to work on performance goals, and everybody does that as well, you've doubled your lifetime value. That means each customer is now worth twice as much as they were when you just have a front-end plan of care option. Well, that's important to know. Number one, if, you have, if you're looking at what the business is worth, that's very important. Also, from a marketing standpoint, it's incredibly important. If you said, okay, I know a customer is worth $1,000 to me uh, versus a customer is worth $2,000 to me, you can spend more to acquire a customer knowing that information, knowing that you have that back-end revenue than the person that, that only has $1,000 of lifetime value because that customer is worth twice as much to you. So maybe we say, if you know, let's say you have a thousand dollar lifetime value, you're willing to spend one hundred dollars to acquire a customer, versus somebody that has a back end, you know, recurring revenue service. It's they have a lifetime value of two thousand dollars. They're willing to spend two hundred dollars. So the person that can spend more on marketing wins. That's how it works. They can get their advertising in front of people more. They can do more workshops. They can do more uh, local marketing uh, where they're sponsoring races. They can spend more money to get in front of more people and over time they're going to be more visible. They're gonna win assuming their product is equivalent, right? So lifetime value increases your ability to actually spend money to acquire people. So it's a big deal. And I'm gonna show you an example of two clinics that are um, you know, generating recurring revenue at a different percentage and just how big of a difference it ends up being. So let's say clinic one, we have 20 new patients, okay? 20 new patients, we have a 10% transition to recurring revenue. So of those 20 new people in that month that are coming in, 10% are moving over to let's just call it a one time a month, so a one time a month visit, all right? So they're coming in once a month. That means if you have 20 people to come in, two people are moving over to a recurring visit and those are gonna snowball. So first month is two, then it's four, then it's six, and we're gonna look at this for the year, okay? So two a month, and we're also gonna assume that no drop off, which there will be drop off, that's called churn, that's people that are, that are deciding they don't wanna continue on with ongoing services, that's normal. But in this scenario, we're just gonna leave it as, for this year, you have zero churn in both scenarios, okay? So after 12 months, you're gonna end up with 24 recurring visits. So that would be, you know, 24 visits that are coming in that 12th month, <clears throat> or after that 12th month that are going to be on the schedule no matter what you do you do any marketing whatsoever you know you have any social media presence website nothing they're just there right they're there it's stability in your in your clinic if your average visit rate let's call it two hundred dollars is uh is where you're at then that's going to generate twenty four hundred dollars in recurring revenue for your clinic on a monthly basis at that point okay twenty four hundred dollars which isn't bad okay it's a heck of a lot better than not having anything that's at a 10% uh, conversion percentage to your to your recurring revenue uh, option, which in this example, we're gonna say is just a one visit per month. So clinic two, they're gonna get 30% of people that are gonna transition over to that. So they have a 30% conversion percentage over to a one time a month visit, which means they're gonna generate 
uh, six visits per month. So 30% of the 20 people that are coming in, which is six, are gonna move over to one visit per month. So they're generating six visits per month for every 20 visit, or twenty new visits that they bring in. New patients that they bring in turn into six long-term patients, all right? So that times 12 months is gonna give us 72 recurring sessions, recurring visits on a monthly basis after a year. 72 times your average visit rate of 200 is going to give you $14,400 in recurring revenue. Now, keep this in mind. This is really, really, really important. You have the same number, same number of new patients. This is the hardest to, thing to do in a business. To generate new volume is the hardest thing to do. It's what stops people from starting clinics. And it's one of the reasons why people go out of business is because they can't on a continual basis acquire business, uh, you know, uh, like new clients, new patients in their actual business. So when they're there, it sure as hell makes sense to try to uh, make sure that you give them a reason to stick around. It has to be a value, by the way. It just can't be you just throw something at them you think that they want. Like they have to actually want it and they have to see value at it. And it has to make sense on both sides. Like that's the only way a recurring visit uh, volume works or any sort of recurring service that you have. But if you can really understand this, you can really engineer in the appropriate way to sell this, which is very different than selling a front end plan of care. Then you can 3X the conversion of moving people over to uh, ongoing visits, but it's not a 3X. It's not a 3X of your actual revenue. It's way more than that. It's basically a six, seven X. And it's because it's compounding in a positive direction whenever you have recurring revenue, it snowballs. And that is the biggest difference that I want everyone to understand. If you're watching this, this is what I'm talking about of why recurring revenue is so valuable to outside investors, why it's so valuable to you know uh, investment bankers or people that wanna buy businesses. And it's why it's so valuable to your business is because with more effort at trying to move people over to the recurring revenue side, and you can improve your percentage by 20%, which is not a massive difference, by the way. It, I'm not telling you, I'm not saying that you've gone from 10% to 100%. You've gone from 10% to 30%. But at the end of a year, you have six to seven times more recurring revenue in your business by improving this one lever, this one area in your business. And this is the whole game of business, by the way. This is it. It's what areas are we, do we need to engineer? I need to understand the model across the beginning of the relationship of a new client to literally lifetime value ongoing just on the sales cycle. Then it's people and hiring and, and it's your culture and it's space and all that. There's all these variables, but when it comes to your sales cycle and your marketing, it's very, very mathematical. And if you can understand where these drop-off points are, and you can start to engineer small changes in all of these, this is where we can see somebody go from a practice that's generating $100,000 barely, you know, and they're working their ass off, to all of a sudden they're at a half a million dollars and they're working less. And it's because they're focused attention on the right things. And when we look at these, the recurring revenue of this, ask yourself, which one would you rather have? Because you have the same number of new people coming in, but your recurring revenue is six times higher if you do a better job of recurring. That's your payroll. That's literally overhead and admin and a physical therapist right there in recurring revenue just by you working on this one variable. And that's why I'm so adamant about people understanding the whole cycle and not necessarily just focus on new patients, new patients, new patients. That's, that's what I get more than anything. And that's fine because that is a really important constraint in the business. But if you are just focusing on the front end, you're, a, you're an amateur. You don't understand what you're talking about. You, you are missing the bigger picture here of what real like value drives in a business in terms of being able to have ongoing services, recurring revenue, and more importantly, keep this in mind, you're missing out on the opportunity to help somebody with a long-term health and wellness change. Our healthcare system is fucked. Let's be honest, like it's not good. Have you ever gone to the doctor recently? Have you gone to a hospital? What kind of information are you getting? It's reactive. Many of my friends are physicians. They, they don't like it either. They don't have time with people. They don't have the opportunity to talk to them about drinking more water and sleeping and managing stress and, stress and moving, but guess who does? We do. We have an opportunity to talk to people about that. So we get a chance to have a business that is a, a great business to own that can literally provide a great life for you and your family. And on the flip side of that, you get a chance to change someone's life forever. Not to mention the people in the ecosystem around them that starts to see the health changes that they're making. Their brother, their, their spouse, their 
uh, their kids, you know, their, their neighbors. They start to have a positive effect on everybody else around them. So yes, this is a business, but it's bigger than that. It's more important than just a business. It's more important than just the, the numbers on the page. That means you have 72 people that are coming back in on a monthly basis that are getting healthier. That is an astronomic value that you're adding to your community. And yeah, you're getting compensated for it. And it's not a nonprofit, but man, it feels like it sometimes. It feels like the mission is so awesome and so personally rewarding that the fact that we get paid for this is just like, it, what, what an amazing combination. So understanding how to run a business and the people that you're helping and how you're helping them long term, they go hand in hand. So sometimes you got to get over the, how do I sell this? I don't like to talk to people about money. My staff doesn't like to talk to people about money. Think about what I just said. Think about the, the changes you're actually making with people. And they probably feel very compelled to want to help them make those changes too. And you can't do it if they don't come in and help you. It's that simple. They've got to come in and help you. So in summary, I'll wrap this up because obviously I got a little, I got a little uh, heated and off track there. Recurring revenue. There's a few big reasons uh, that you're going to want to do this. Number one, it's going to make you less dependent on patient volume. It's going to increase your enterprise value, meaning what your business is worth at the end of the day when you decide, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. I want to sell it. I want to move on to something else, or I want to find somebody to come in and, and you know run the business as, a, as a, a clinical director or something like that. It adds value to the business in a, in a huge way. It allows you to be more predictable with hiring, and it increases lifetime value of your clients, which is another huge metric when we look at enterprise value in the business. The three areas that we see that are doing well currently with these types of businesses is recurring visits. So recurring visits, group training, and remote coaching. Pick your flavor. Which one do you like, right? Which one do you want to do? The easiest one to implement in most practices is going to be some variation of recurring volume. Uh, that is just going to be visits that you're already doing anyway. You just to get to uh, have a bit of a different conversation with people, work on a bit of different you know, uh, skills and movement skills and information that's going to be more sort of like wellness performance related and a little bit less of solving like a pain problem. Uh, and then really try to shoot for 30% of your revenue. Um, ideally, if you can get to 50%, that's huge. That's enormous. And don't forget that if you can increase your, uh, your recurring revenue from 10% to 30% in the course of a year, you can six to almost seven X the, the amount of recurring revenue that you actually have in your business at the end of the day. So Hopefully, this is enough for you to really sit there and think, man, I need to uh, definitely start to work on adding recurring revenue to my business. It's a game changer. It's the number one thing I talk to you know, people about that don't have this in their business, which is basically everybody. Very few people do. It's the number one thing I would go back and tell myself back in the day whenever I was in a windowless room in a CrossFit gym starting my practice, not knowing a damn thing about what I was doing. Um, you know, and, and, and I wish I would have known because my, pra my practice would have grown a lot faster and I would have had a lot more stability and security in the, in the, the revenue that it was generating. And uh, if, if this is something that you're trying to figure out on your own, by the way, this should be a great place to start. If you wanna get some help in actually implementing this with people that are doing this across the country with literally hundreds of clinics actively right now, and also sharing best practices of all of those together, it's, it's equivalent to being uh, you know, in a franchise, but we don't own any of your business. You know, we are partner level uh, working with you without actually being a partner in your business. It's, it's the most fair way that we can actually work with people where we feel very tied to your business, but we don't own it. And we're trying to help you actively grow your business to where you're adding enterprise value and achieving the goals that you have, as well as leveraging best practices from all these different demographic areas from all over the country that we see on a monthly basis as we look at what's working and pulling those best practices together to then share internally with everybody that we work with. If that's something that you're interested in, head to physicaltherapybiz.com. Check out what we got going on. You can read a bunch of you know case studies and testimonies of different people that we've worked with. Uh, you can read our backgrounds. You know, I'm a physical therapist. I went to school, uh, you know, to become a physical therapist. I practiced as a physical therapist for over a decade. I taught continuing education for other physical therapists before I got into uh, helping anybody with business. Uh, it's I, not necessarily the path that I thought I would be on, but I think it's the place I can make the biggest uh, difference. So if you are interested in working with a company like that, that has you know a lot of integrity in how we work with people. Uh, hold ourselves to a high standard and expect a lot of you as well. You can't just work with somebody and not do the work yourself and expect there to be a change. So if you're willing to do work and you're willing to make a change in your business, you want to be around a bunch of other people that are trying to live a ha happy, healthy, wealthy life wh like, like we're doing and we want to try to help everybody else do, um, then check it out. Maybe we're the right fit for you. And if that sounds like the absolute wrong fit for you, great. That's cool too. I'm sure you'll find your people, uh, but better to find you know so them somewhere else because that's our goals. That's our core values. That's who we work with. So as always, appreciate you watching. Hopefully this helps and uh, let us know if we can help you in any other way. If not, I'll see you in the next video.